So my presentation tonight is radio de-expeditioning with a radio in a box. And we'll start by talking about the old days. For you old timers, there used to be a time when one guy would go to a country and he'd take a radio and no linear and put up a dipole and work 30 to 40 people. We're talking about guys like uh, Don Miller and before that, the Hallicrafters crew that after World War II went around Africa. And um, it wasn't very high tech. A lot of KWM2s, a lot of simple helicrafters radios. And they worked the same two to 300 hams on each de expedition. A de expedition to work a thousand people was unheard of. So I got started by going to rare countries in the Pacific with groups of 12, 15. Here's Midway in 2009. You charter a plane put 19 people on it, you put up 20 antennas, live in tents, generators, well, in Midway, we had power, commercial power. Um, tons of equipment, large antennas, and exhaustion, if you look at the lower uh, right-hand corner. In 2011, we went to VP8ORK. Again, tents up, boat trips, hundreds of thousands of dollars to cross the Drake Passage. Um, outdoor latrines, they're always fun. And then again, down at the bottom, you'll see uh, people sleeping from two weeks of radioing and a week of setup and travel. My last trip was KH1, Baker Island. Again, extremely rare, extremely hard to get permission to operate from. We had 12 operators. We had a charter a boat for 350,000. We again operated in tents. We had outdoor latrines again. We had two tons of equipment that had to be shipped. Budgets of four to 500,000 to some of these places are not unheard of. And the overriding theme is you're done with the de-expedition and you're exhausted. So when we went to Baker, we tried to think of how we could make this easier on not only us, but on the people trying to work us. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service, not only the US, but all of them, whether it's New Zealand or Australia or the Indian authorities are all limiting access to these remote islands. Um, so while we were on Baker and on the way back, especially, we had this discussion on what we could do to alleviate the hardships, whether it be permission. Another one was the cost. In 1997, VK0IR was a 300,000 expedition. Uh, 3Y0J in January of this year spent 650000 And we won't even talk about what they ran into and how they missed their goal. Um, as I said, KH1 in Baker Island, we made 70,000 cues and it cost us 350000 And in addition to those costs, it is not uncommon, like on Baker, we each put $20,000 of our own money in the pot. Average shipping, you know, could be five tons. Imagine the cost of that, whole containers. Shipping is easily the number two expense on a de-expedition after the boat or a chartered plane. And then look at the operators I showed you in the previous slides, 60s. 70s on Midway, we had a guy in his 80s. And frankly, uh, we're getting old for this. And lastly, time. Uh, Baker was a month out of my life. VP8ORK a month. Um, if you can't take a commercial flight there, um, you're looking at two weeks of operating, two weeks of transit, and 
days of setting up and days of tearing down and the cost of, you know, the time is easily 25% of the budget. So if there's going to be a better way, how do you do this? Well, the better way should help get permission to go to these places. As uh, Eric just said, uh, it's, some of these things never get on the air. We want to reduce the cost of all this shipping, tents, um, generators, latrines, chairs, eight stations, um, linears. You have to reduce the equipment. You have to reduce teardown and set up. It took us two full days to set up on Baker. Um, the group going to Bouvet earlier this year took five days because of weather. Um, reduce the trips to the island. On Baker, we had the boat bringing us food twice a day, bringing us water, bringing us fuel. Um, you have to reduce those trips over these coral reefs. They're just not safe. You want to provide lots of QSOs. If you spend two days building a little city, that's a lot of energy spent. And then you have to operate eight to 12 hours a day. And the other thing is the comfort. Sitting on a 110 degree beach or in a tent on Sydney Island where it never really got above 40 hours, uh, 40 degrees, um, com creature comforts, go with operator fatigue. So this is what I consider the original rip. It's the Apollo moon landing. And everybody thought that the astronauts spoke to the command module right overhead. But the reality is they used S-band back to Earth, which then relayed the signals back to the command module. So uh, that's probably the first rig in a box. So as I said, in 2018, we went to Baker. While we were planning on Baker, knowing that we would have to be going over this very shallow reef to get the people on board and everything, and the fact that Fish and Wildlife said the whole team couldn't be on the island at the same time, we set up two K3 zeros on the boat where we were gonna use a 900 megahertz link to the island. We thoroughly tested this system. We had AA7A install it in Arizona and it was rock solid. The problem was when we got to Baker and our ship Denia would roll in the seas when weather got rough, the link became totally unreliable and we could not use the two remote radios from people manning the boat. So we came home and we thought about how are we going to fix this? And one of the things we did is AA7JV, George Walner built new ribs and the link used two antennas on each end. And with the dual beams, we got a lot more throughput on the 900 megahertz link. And that meant that he could operate from his boat when he went to the Bahamas. In 2021, we further advanced the 900 megahertz links through better um, modems. And we also started operating using cell phones during contests where some of the operators would connect via cell phones. Um, 2022, we really hit the jackpot when Starlink became available in the Bahamas. Now we would get broadband speed. We could connect with any desk and see the complete operating system by then we had moved from the K3s we were using to Flex 6700s because the whole idea behind Flex was the remote connectivity. 
And in 2023, AA7JV on his magnet boat went out to the Pacific and we've just finished operating from French Polynesia, the Marquesas, Ducey Island, and Northern Cooks. This is the basic configuration um, of the idea behind the rib. You put a radio in a box on an island, you connect with control and data acquisition through a home-built Pi network that we have, that we've programmed. Um, you have less antennas on an island because each antenna for each rib will operate on five, six bands. We have local operators that will set these up on an island. They're on the boat. They connect to Starlink. Starlink connects to the internet. And the remote operators, instead of each connecting to the boat, they get their audio and everything off the internet um, for audio uh, in and out. This is what it looks like. They're watertight. They're water-cooled. We have external radiators with pumps to heat the, uh, to cool the radios and whatever is in the box in the hot sun. You have power supplies. Um, as I mentioned, the interior cooling fan. This rib has a linear. Not all ribs have linears. The ribs that do not have linears have two radios. This is a single radio rib. Um, you see in the middle, the Flex 6700, the control module, which does data acquisition and sends it back to the boat through an ethernet switch and the aforementioned 900 megahertz link. So you have 900 megahertz links from the boat to the island, but not from any of the operators directly to the island. For the engineers among you, uh, on the left are laptops and data acquisition that connect to a switch, the 900 megahertz link with double antennas. And then this is a three, a two rib configuration on the island. You have one with the linear and one without the linear. And you see each one has a radio connected to it. You could have an antenna connected. You could have two antennas on each rib. Each rib has two antenna ports. After French Polynesia, where we had nine ops, we quickly grew a team of contesters, DXers, um, who all wanted part of operating from their living room. And, and it's really nice. You have dinner you're with your family. You uh, connect to one of these radios in Ducey. And you can operate two, four, six, eight hours a day um, from the comfort of your room. Um, I'll show you how in a minute. But you'll recognize a lot of the calls in this list. They didn't operate on all three of our remote operations from the magnet. Some operated like Marty from uh, Ducey Island, uh, OH2BH. Others operated all three of the islands. Um, some just did uh, Northern Cooks. So all of a sudden, instead of a dozen exhausted hams, you have dozens ready to take over um, when there was an open spot. This is what the screen looked like. This is me operating sideband from Ducey Island. You open up two instances of N1MM, one for transmit, one to tune the receiver. Any of you that own a Flex, see the Flex radio screen on the right where you can change bands, 
tune the antennas um, on the far left you'll see the flex radio software control modules you're controlling something called dax which is your audio in and out you're controlling the cat to control the radio and then you're also using a piece of software called mumble mumble was invented by gamers so they could talk to each other while they played it's very low latency it has very little throughput and mumble loads each radio to a server it can be in london it can be in washington state 10 people can connect to this mumble server and listen to the QSOs. None of them connect directly to the ship. So when you think of multiple ops, all trying to connect over Starlink to the magnet, imagine the throughput you would need to handle that kind of traffic. But we take all that overhead and latency, dump it on a server, in the US or Europe or Singapore, and that's where the operators can connect to. What you're looking is at is a screen, which is any desk. So you put any desk at your house, and then you put any desk on a laptop on the boat. Again, none of this connects to the island. All this overhead you're seeing is not being connected by the remote op to the operator. So we keep the latency over that 900 megahertz link to a minimum. And all of the software is running on the ship on a dedicated laptop. And you connect to each radio with a different any desk address. Nothing is connected. There's no N1MM talking to all the other computers. This is what it looks like FT8. FT8 is by far the simplest way of remote operating because every so often the Starlink might kick out, but in Foxhound, if you look in the center, you're filling a queue of people you're copying. And so every single queue, when we operated on our the expeditions, which is also the ARRO rules, there's no automatic operating. You're always hearing about some of the, the expeditions making 100,000 queues, with two guys that never really operate. They just set up FT8 and go about fishing. We clicked on every single call. We chose every call. Every single operator was human initiated. So this is what it looks like. Again, an any desk screen running FT8, WSJTX. You click on calls, you fill the queue, and you log the queue. Set. This is CW. Like sideband, audio out via mumble. Two instances of N1MM. You've got your transmit control. You've got your receive control. You tune the pile up with the mouse. And again, the mouse is in your room controlled by any desk controlling the screen top of the laptop that's on the back. This is what the remote ops on the boat see. They've got their maestro, which is a flex remote head where they operate and they see the remote operators operating. So if there's a problem, meaning a laptop hangs up or the link on uh, Starlink goes down, they see it immediately. The other thing that happens occasionally in a flex radio is if the 900 megahertz link starts losing packets because the boat has shifted or in some cases a bird gets in the way of an antenna and knocks it askew, we do lose the connectivity to the radio. The ops here see it. If it's something drastic, they can go to the island and fix it. If not, sometimes just restarting all the flex software will cure it. This is me operating uh, from Ducey Island. 
Um, I've got my MacBook on the left running one remote radio. I've got my center computer running a second remote radio on a different band. And on the right, I'm monitoring what is coming off North Cook. And if there's some DX I need to work, I can still operate my radio from home on my on my system while running two pileups on Ducey Island. And in fact, I did that several times. How do you control dozens of operators? Well, we set up a Google sheet, an Excel spreadsheet. I think they call it Google, whatever, Google Sheets. And each remote operator chooses when he wants to operate. If we have scheduled downtime, which you can see on Monday, nobody's in the schedule, but everybody knows where the other radios are. So if you want to operate 20 meters, you make sure the second radio is not operating on 20. We made the QSOs on Ducey with two radios operating remotes and one radio operated by the locals. But remember, the locals could always operate a remote radio. So if you see an open slot on one of these uh, remote radios and nobody's there, the operators running the radios on the ship, and there were three of them, could take over an open an open slot. So you get maximum usage of the radios, minimum downtime, and operators that are refreshed when they take over. Here's another view. This is W6IZT. He's operating from the deck of the magnet. Again, you can see he has complete control of his radio, monitoring the other two remote radios, and you have other control software running um, that aren't necessarily seen by the remote operators on the other laptops. We also had a six meter radio up on the boat where we could monitor six meters in case of an opening. Uh, we never copied anything the whole time we were on DC. So what's some of the secret sauce here? I mentioned Starlink. Without Starlink, this wouldn't happen. There are no cell phone activities. Satellite on the previous generations, uh, it, just, it, it just didn't have the throughput. We're talking about um, all the other commercial satellite things you've Previously heard of the expeditions taking 30 minutes to upload logs. It, ju it just doesn't work. Um, the other thing is if you ever run on generator power, the minute you start transmitting on a high duty mode like CW or even FT8, you hear the generators stall and come up to full load. And the only way to prevent that is to build these lithium polymer batteries to act as a buffer between the generators and the 12 volt power supplies. So when, when you hit transmit, the generators stay in echo mode. They don't power up. They don't lose voltage because if your voltage drops to 10 volts or something, your flux is going to restart. It just cannot take anything less than 12 volts um, to stay solid for you. So we put in these 50 farad capacitors. We had these rapid charge, recharge, batteries, and the generators just hummed along without any of that cycling due to uh, duty. Um, again, we didn't have five antennas hooked up to each radio. We had these Mike Stahl designed, what he calls a V8, 
It's about a 40 foot vertical and it's got a tuner so that as you switch bands, you retune the vertical and you cover all bands with minimum, minimum footprint on the island. Um, I mentioned any desk. You minimize your waterfalls in WSJTX. You can minimize the waterfall of the flex. And again, you're not putting a lot of data over Starlink. We moved all the controls for controlling the radios to the boat. That took some of the pressure off the 900 megahertz link because again, if the laptops are on the island, which they were on Baker, you have to send that whole screen back to the boat. And 900 megahertz just will not take all that throughput of, you know, multiple radios. And again, we discovered mumble thanks to W1VE, which even gave the CW operators some side time, which we didn't have when we had other solutions. So how did we do? On Baker, which was one of the top 12 countries, we made 69,000 in 12 days. But those 12 days of the island only gave us nine days of operating. We had 11 people camping on the island. We had a latrine, we had showers, we had a dozen tents and tables and chairs. 12 antennas, six radios, six linears, um, eight generators. We used 300 gallons of fuel. We drank 400 gallons of water. As I mentioned, two days set up, one day tear down at 350,000. How did we do on Ducey? Well, it wasn't as rare, so there were less people clamoring for a queue, but 56 is still pretty high. We made 62,000 queues. About 85% of them were from operators off the island. Well, in, in effect, everyone was off the island, but 85% of the queues were made by remote operators to the boat. We were at the island for 14 days. 13 days were operating. Nobody camped on the island. Nobody had to use the latrine on the island. We only had four radios and one linear. Um, we did not use high power. Now, the band conditions this year are much better than they were when we went in 2018, and we didn't need the linears. We had five antennas versus 12, two generators. Only 80 gallons of fuel, which is five milliliters per kiso. Um, one gallon of water, five hours set up, two hours tear down. And we could have chartered a boat. Um, there are many boats out there that could have gone to Ducey for about $125,000. We didn't have to charter a boat because we had the magnet owned by a 7 jv But... If you're comparing apples and apples, you have to have a cost associated with the boat. This is the magnet, and that is the magnet at DC. You can see it anchored offshore. If you look in the center of the screen, you'll see the 900 megahertz antennas. On the left is the 160 antenna. All the way on the right is one of the rib antennas that went up to 80 meters. Two hours after we went QRT, all the antennas are down. Everything's cleared off the beach. This is the landing craft that AA7JV built um, with Mike KN4EEI that's on the left side. On that landing craft, you have all the generators, all the 900 megahertz equipment, all the radios in a box. Nothing leaves that pontoon boat. Only the antennas get set up off that boat. That's how you can tear down a system, a station in two hours. I mentioned we were in French Polynesia. 
This is the deployment of FO stroke N1DG on Tiki How. And again, all you see are three antennas in the pontoon boat. In fact, you have to really look in the center in the distance. That's how far the magnet is from Tiki How. It was close to a mile away. There's a lot of discussion these days about pirates and people operating um, using your call. Well, this is how we dealt with pirates on uh, Ducey. You can see uh, the locals helping us round them up. Little stab at humor. Here's something else you didn't see, operator exhaustion. The three operators on the boat got to sleep in beds, had air conditioning. They didn't get cold, they didn't get hot. The operators at home certainly didn't look like this. This is W0GJ on Desicheo. You didn't see latrines. There was no need for any of that. You didn't see two tons of freight. You didn't see desks and chairs and all the things that get wildlife agencies ticked off about here's a pristine environment and a dozen hams come in um, with tents and chairs and generators and multiple trips. We went once a day to the island and that's that's the extent of it pop up the generators make sure wind or something didn't damage something um and lastly so far we've built six radios in a box um that's about 10 flex 6700s um four of them are on the magnet and just finished up an operation on Ducey. We have two more that we're willing to lend out to the expeditions. Um, NCDXF, of which I'm treasurer, um, funded these six ribs and will continue to fund them as we need them for the expeditions. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and let's see how we're doing on time. Good. We have time for questions. Okay. Uh, Barry, what's it look like in chat? Barry, Barry, Barry. Huh. Mary, you're muted. Chat is good right now. Okay, I see hands up all over the place. Gene, take it away. Yeah, good evening, everybody. This is Gene, N3X US in Colleen, Texas. I am really shocked at the logistical cost of these adventures. And that's why I call them. I mean, it, it really is an adventure. And, you know, we see articles in QST every month about various de expeditions, and they might talk a little bit about cost, but they talk more about the uh, equipment being used and all the logistical challenges. But I was just really amazed at the costs of these de expeditions. And uh, I can't see how an individual would keep on do doing this and doing this, besides being extremely dedicated to the expeditions. But I take my hat off to them and salute them. I mean, keep up the good work. And even if you uh, older folks like me start, you know, having second thoughts about your health situation, well, get it checked out with the doctor first and see if you're good to go. If so, still take it easy. Thanks, all. There's a question uh, about, could the rib be run on sap, solar and batteries? Well, the answer is yes. But in order 
to get the voltage and the amount of wattage you would need, you would be covering beaches with solar panels, which again goes against what Fish and Wildlife wants you to do with a minimum footprint. So theoretically, yes, but we didn't find that in the Bahamas as very feasible. All right, Marty, go ahead and take it. Thank you. Uh, great presentation, Don. Thanks a lot. Uh, um, what has Fish and Wildlife's um, response to these been so far? Have you had them, uh, you know, specifically accept or specifically reject or impose additional conditions on these? Well, since we went to Baker, I've been trying to get to Jarvis Island, which is part of Palmyra Jarvis. And in about two weeks, you will see a publication by the Department of the Interior for comments on allowing hams access to Jarvis Island. And we're pretty convinced that their quickness to say no now in the future um, will be less given that their big arguments, the footprint, and the possible damage to the island. And we're taking that away from the equation. Um, so hopefully in a couple of weeks, they'll publish the what they call compatibility determination. And that will be proof because the last group of hams allowed on Jarvis was, I believe, 2008. Okay, very good, very good. And on the 900, I've seemed to recall that originally the issue on that 900 megahertz link was that the ship was moving so you couldn't use a directional antenna, but on on the shore you could because it wasn't moving and all it had to do was point at the ship. Is that how you're still configuring it? We now have two verticals on shore and two verticals on the ship. That's the most optimal way of allowing the ship to reposition in wind as well as um, getting rid of the dropouts. Okay, and you're using uh, two verticals for diversity? Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Very, very good. Anybody else? Mark's raising his hand. I have a question. Are most of the expeditions held in what you would call a uninhabited island which means that they have nobody there that lives on that island or anything no in fact most of the expeditions like when we just did north cooks or french polynesia have locals even midway island one of the rarest ones has u.s fish and wildlife personnel living there but there's probably about 15 to 20 uninhabited islands. And those are usually your top 15 on the DXCC wanted list. And they require, and then a lot of these islands have people living there, but no resident hams. So, you know, it it's, they have electricity, they have everything. They even have flights uh, like Christmas Island, but there are no resident hams. So more or less, the fish and wildlife people don't have a problem with their, what you would say, the island's own countrymen living there and making a mess or doing whatever they do. But yet you as an outsider, they make it, I'll say, a hundred times as hard to say, oh my, you might drop a piece of paper on the sand or so forth and so on. Trust me, I'm not anti-conservationist. Don't get me wrong, guys. But I just think that sometimes these fish and wildlife make a, more of a to-do over stuff that than it really needs to be. Done. Well, I, I think these people have a mission. 
and the mission is to protect the island. And ham radio doesn't meet that mission. They generally try to allow ham radio operators on these islands once every 10 to 15 years. Um, they let us on Baker. Um, I've been to Wake. I've been to Midway. Um, others have been to other islands. It's just, you know, the way the expeditions were done in the past are a large presence on these islands. When we set up on Midway, I remember Matt Brown came out of his uh, um, cottage and looked at the beach and he said, oh my God, how many birds are you going to kill? Well, it turned out we didn't kill any, but that's, that's their mindset. We have a different one. Um, that's, I guess, the way it goes. Hopefully, so we can change that. So, more or less, Don, it's the cost of being an amateur radio operator. And I hate to phrase it that way, but as they say, you're always going to have those that don't have a problem, and you're going to have those that do have a problem, like. I'll just use, for example, where I live. Um, when I wanted to put up my 100 foot, or not my 100 foot, but my 50 foot Rhone 25G tower, all my neighbors knew that I was an amateur radio operator in the community. And I had to get a variant because that was, you know, what was more or less the situation in the township that I live. And they just figured I was putting up another antenna. They never had interference. They never had problems. But yet I had one neighbor that had a real problem, afraid that the tower was going to fall during a storm. And yet what was, when we had the hearing, one of the men on the variance committee was an undertaker. And he had been a longtime undertaker in the community. And he said to the man, and I'll just use the, the name Mr. X. He said, if there's a bad storm, he says, you have a lot of high trees in the front of your property. And he said, yes, I do. He said, but he said, if we have a real bad windstorm, the air is going to go through Mark's tower. And yet the wind may have a problem with your trees. Well, wouldn't you know it? Five years later, guys. We had a bad storm on a Friday night, and this man had one of his major trees in the front of his property drop, and it landed on his electrical wires and pulled out the whole, all the electrical wires out of his, basically, that were going into his house from the power company, and he lost power. He had all the expense, and yet Mark's tower stood firm. And I always remember that, you know, it, you know, and I had somebody, a friend say today, you know, it's amazing how your neighbors say what you as the property owner can do and not do. And it almost seems, you know, that these fish and wildlife, you know, sometimes, like I say, I think they, 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 they talk more than, they, it's almost like they talk, but they don't think before they say something. Oh, I disagree with that. Because again, these are biologists that are hired for one reason. And that reason is not to allow a dozen people. By the way, it's not only hams that can't go there. Divers can't go there. Um, people making movies need special permits. Um, they're not picking on ham radio. They're picking on... Anything that is not part of the presidential proclamation that sets up a reserve. Um, and the presidential proclamation that set up Palmyra and Jarvis, for instance, um, was Ronald Reagan. So, I mean, it's, it's just not the thing. There's a question about younger hams and these costs of the expeditions. 
actually NCDXF will fund young people to go on these D expeditions. And there's a group going to Guyana and we just paid for the airfare and everything else. So this German lad can join the D expedition. So the answer to the question is there are scholarships for younger hams to go on these D expeditions. How about us, us older hams, like 78 years old? And You're out of luck. Then oh, you do the fly-in expeditions like like my friends and I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, gentlemen, uh, ladies, if there are any here, please uh, hold your hand if you want to talk. We'll call upon you, but if you start just jumping in, we'll start getting a lot of double in here. Uh, Marty, you had your hand up while ago. Yeah, I wanted to ask Don. Um, uh, you had worked up uh, your group, uh, the Dateline D Expedition, uh, uh, D Association, had worked up a... Uh, uh, a plan to provide use use the facilities of the rib uh, to provide some uh, data uh, data gathering and monitoring capabilities for the fish and wildlife folks that they don't already have in some places. Has that gone anywhere in terms of you know floating that with the fish and wildlife folks where they actually get a benefit out of your being there? We proposed it for. Um, Johnston Island, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the fish and wildlife people were really excited about it. But guess who nixed that idea? The U.S. Air Force, which has half of the um, ownership of Johnston Island. So here we made great inroads with fish and wildlife. And the U.S. Air Force said... Um, you're not putting radios on our island. So it's not just fish and wildlife. You've got military. When was the last time anybody went to North Korea to operate? Um, <laughs> so we all remember when you couldn't work a Chinese station. I mean, I was a ham for 30 years mm -hmm. um, before I ever heard a Chinese station. Um, and it had nothing to do with ecology. So I don't think I could be wrong, but there are a lot of hams operating in Iran these days, things like that. So it's it's not there's all sorts of impediments for getting permission to operate it. That's why they're rare. They're rare yeah. for a reason. <laughs> Thanks. OK, Eric, you got your hand up. Be sure to turn your camera around when you come on. Uh, did you would you say turn what on? Your camera. Oh, okay. There you go. How's that? That's great. Okay, thank you. Um, hey, Don, um, I was reading uh, two questions. Uh, I was reading uh, an article, I think, uh, about six months ago. Uh, there was a D expedition. I can't say where it was, where they were trying to go. You're probably going to know. And there was some opposition from the, again, the conservation folks about antennas. Uh, something about they wanted to put a beam up or something or a hex beam or whatever. And they said that that could affect a bird could fly into it and get killed or some something like that. Now, I saw that photo you showed and uh, you had verticals there. Is there any is there any types of antennas that are allowed and ones that aren't allowed? That was my first uh, question. My second question, I'll give it to you now if that's OK is um, I would like to know if I could volunteer for one of the D expeditions. Um, I was uh, very instrumental with uh, Joe Taylor helping out with the inventing uh, the FT8 Fox and Hound. Uh, still very active with the upgrades to it. Um, so if you guys who put these D expeditions together would like to have a volunteer, I'd be certainly willing to to do that here as an operator <clears throat> from my home QTH. So uh, uh, that's it. Back to you, Don. Okay. Uh, the first question. Um, we're not sure where the idea got into not only fish and wildlife, but even people living in condominiums and that have COAs, everybody thinks a vertical antenna 
is a better idea. Um, on an island, believe it or not, a vertical antenna will beat the pants off a of Yagi any day of the week. You can put a vertical up antenna up next to the water, and there is no beam that you can put up in a similar location that is going to outperform it. So Yagi's, Yagi's just don't work at 25 feet. Um, a vertical works really good. So you can put up SVGAs, phased arrays, uh, two verticals, one being a reflector, and have a much better propagation result than a beam. The other thing is um, we keep adding remote operators all the time. So Eric, send me an email. Okay. Peter, you got your hand up, sir. You need to unmute. You're talking about me? I'm talking about you, sir. No, yeah, you too, Bruce. When you come on, you need to, you need to uh, turn your camera on. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Sorry about that. I had my uh, preamp unplugged. Uh, anyway, um, this is the first time I've heard of this remote operating. And so I'm wondering, you know, the value of a contact that's made between an operator that's at home and an operator that's actually on the island, I think has more value than an op op a contact that's made with an operator that's remote, even though the transmitter is on the island. So I'm wondering if there isn't some way to, um, you know, identify the fact that, you know, this de-expedition call is coming from somebody that is actually sitting at home, you know, in, in New York City versus out on the island, just so that there's some acknowledgement of the fact that you okay. know, that's, it's a different kind of situation. That's what I'm wondering. All our QSOs are uploaded to Clublog. And if you go to Clublog and look up your QSO, you will see who the operator you worked was. And that will then identify it as a ship island op or a remote op. So all these de-expeditions use something called Clublog and they tell you who the operator was. So you'll get your, you know, your answer that way. Do you, ha do you have to cross-reference that to some other list that says who the operators and the de-exposition were? Well, the website for the remote radio de-expeditions lists the operators and who are remotes. So right. yeah, it's all, it's all published. Okay. The other question I had was, uh, do the uh, vertical antennas have ground radials? The ones that are not in the water do. But you don't need a lot of them. Thank you. Well, I can speak from experience there with the fact that when I lived in Long Beach, California, just about a block away from the from the ocean, I had a vertical antenna with no ground planes, but I didn't have any place for them. And that vertical just, it outperformed the guys with the beams around me. It, it, given whatever circumstances you're working with, it, uh, along that coastline, <laughs> the verticals work great. Okay, uh, Barry, how are we doing in chat? We are up to date. Uh, Dave says that he's just waiting to hear that some enterprise in him Drops a rib on a North Korean beach. We don't okay. like that. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. I said we'd all like that. But I'm not doing it. <laughs> we well, all now, I, I have a question because let's just say, Don, you were operating in a major contest. And I'll just say CQ of Y. And let's say you were going to, I'll just say, a place down in Australia. Normally, they, you, you would use your call N1DG 
slash, let's say, VK3. So if these remote D expeditions, they're getting people to operate on a remote basis, would it not be better to basically, and I'll just use one call, for example, W2GD, and you all know that call, John Crivelli, who has been on the expeditions before, where it would be, let's say, W2GD slash 3YOJ or 3Y, you know, something like that? Well, the contests allow remote ops. ZF1A, all the ops are remote. There's maybe one guy down in Grand Cayman. So that's been done for a while. And it's perfectly by the rules. You have to um, state that you have remote ops and there are different categories. But remote op in contests has been going on for a while. Well, remote hopping on a D expedition is something what you might call new. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing here is going on a rare D expedition with out having the footprint. Um, for instance, there are D expeditions today to Tuvalu. There's no reason to use a rib on this expedition they have internet they have power uh they're allowed to in the resort put up antennas the rib is specifically for these uninhabited remote islands um where you're trying to work with the conservators of those islands to have a minimum footprint yes marty Yes, I would, I would like to make sure that everybody, you need to raise your hand, you want to talk. You're just jumping in, we're going to have some problems. Marty, go ahead and take it. You're muted, Marty. Sorry, uh, precautionary. <laughs> uh, uh, just to clarify on the, the question about call signs, uh, that really depends on how you get your license. I mean, remember, you know, somebody jokingly talked about dropping a, a rib on the North Korea beach. Well, if it doesn't have the, the government's license uh, approval, uh, then it's not going to count for anything anyway. Uh, you know, I've I've done uh, I don't do the the uh, charter remote kinds of things, but I've been in about 20 contest expeditions. And uh, generally speaking, um, you know, we we deal with whatever the licensing authority is and we use uh if, you know, if we typically will get a call sign that is a local call sign for the purposes of the contest or we will use the call of one of the resident operators there uh, uh you know if and so if you know if you're if you're operating for example uh in in a european like we did you know uh, golf japan too um uh, you know, if you're operating as an individual with, you know, not using their license, you use the uh, the CEPT reciprocal arrangement. Yeah, then it's GJ2 slash N6VI. But if they give you, you have a club call or you they give you a call for the purposes of the uh, operating the contest, then you'll have, uh, you know, you won't be using your own call. You'll be using the one that the local official has has given you. And we've done an awful lot of that. And there usually isn't a problem doing it. Okay, back to you, Don. Well, I think Marty said it perfectly. I mean, the French Polynesia Tiki Howe operation was FO stroke M1DG. I had to apply to the French Polynesian PTT for that license. VP6A, we applied to Pitcairn, and we told them that there would be licensed hams and we gave them copies of the licenses that would be using the call you don't in in the case of if we go to a u.s fish and wildlife u.s possession every operator must have a license that meets the requirements of the u.s sept requirements. In fact, I think, Marty, you may know about this. 
There was a contest in the Caribbean recently done by a remote operator who didn't have proper operating permissions in the U.S. And he won the contest, and I believe he will be or may be disqualified. They haven't decided yet. So anytime we do a remote operation, the first thing we do is check the local authorities what is allowed under the terms of the call we get and the license we get. Okay, thank you. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't even see any more hands. How are we doing in chat, Barry? Up to date in chat. Okay. Uh, okay, now we'll open up. You got, you got any comments or anything before we close this down? Been a great presentation. I thank you, Don. Appreciate wow. it. A lot. Uh, Don, if you don't mind, when you get a chance, could you send me the slides from this uh, presentation? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. And Dennis, by George, he's got his hand up. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for what you do. <laughs> what you guys do is awesome. I've got your uh, got your stations in the log quite a few times over the last, uh, well, since the beginning of the year. So that's uh, pretty amazing stuff, and uh, really appreciate that. And you're doing you're doing us a real benefit by doing that, Don. And and it's just amazing. So I got to tell you, I've been all over the world, and it's much more fun operating from home. I get that. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. But what a what a wonderful thing to do. You know, it's just we all benefit. You know, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. It's yeah. amazing what technology has done for us. And we've got some other uh, heavy duty expeditioners on this uh, on this talk, too, like uh, Charlie W6KK and some others. So, uh, uh, you know, with or without the benefit of the rib, uh, they all invest a huge amounts of uh, time and funds and energy. So thank all you guys. Any idea who K6 UFO is? Say again, Bruce, you broke up. Any idea who K6 UFO is? Um, he's one of the West Coast guys, a uh, big contester, and he was one of our remote ops, actually. So he's he's not he's he's not like me, a UFO investigator. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay, well, gentlemen, unless we got some more here, we're going to wrap it up with a great one. We really appreciate it. I'll, I'll open up for one more big shout for questions, either in chat or hands up, where we pull the plug here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for taking it. Thanks, Don. Very, very, we really appreciate it. Okay, 73 is everyone. Uh, Dave Wilsey will hopefully see some of you guys, if not all of you, tomorrow, Thursday, same time, same place. <laughs>